we will be waiting for five minutes to let others join and then we'll be starting Good evening everyone, I hope I am audible and visible. So we will be starting today's session.
is the power point visible? Okay, welcome again to week 4 of the PMR of NCTF session on animal physiology. As we have been doing in the previous week's uh, sessions, we will be solving different assignment questions from the previous year's run of this particular course. And in this particular week, we are going to look at neural system 1. In this week's sessions, we had mostly gone through advanced concepts of muscular system and gone a bit into the neural system but not really when we had learned uh, more in depth about the le length tension curves of muscles and sarcomeres about how exactly sarcomeres function and much more and we will be dealing with all of this today i will briefly introduce myself my name is Anbhav Chatterjee i'm a prime minister research fellow and a phd scholar at iit kanpur and I'm, I will be hosting these sessions on Tuesdays. So if anyone has any question from this week's uh, coursework, then you can post it in the chat or unmute yourself and ask. Otherwise, we'll be going on with the previous year's assignment questions and try solving them. I guess no one has any questions. Uh, so, first, uh, so the uh, this is the YouTube link to all the PMR of NPTEL sessions. All of these sessions are recorded and will be uploaded in due time to a YouTube playlist, which you can freely access anytime, so that you can go through it whenever you are free and rework or anything that you had missed. And these the link to the YouTube playlist is available on the course website as well. So, considering we had been talking a lot about the anatomy of the muscle cell, and we will not be touching it up on this after this particular lecture, uh, after this week, I hope that we will be finishing it off with uh, overall anatomy of the muscle cell, so we know where we are, so that it is easier for us to go through the assignment questions this week. So here is a video on this. Uh, I will be playing this. Please let me know if you can hear the audio from this. Now why don't we take a step back and take a look at how muscles work on more of a macro level. Is this audible? I will be then switching on a little this over here, switching on the captions. And this is obviously from Khan Academy. You can uh, go ahead and look into it, it's a great resource for learning. So, this is the anatomy of the muscle cell. Now, why don't we take a step back and take a look at how muscles work on more of a macro level? So, why don't we? We start out by just drawing a little muscle right here. Let's say this is just the bicep and on either side there's a little bit of tendon that's kind of attached to it right here so that's some tendon. So I'll label that right there and that's just some tendon that's on either side of our muscle, our bicep right here. And the tendon attaches our muscle over to some bone. So there's a little bone right there, there's a little bone right there. Label these guys. So that's one bone end and then here's another one so if it's our bicep it's anchored onto our humerus and this is our bicep right so I'll just draw it in the arm here this guy is sort of like flexing right there coming down to the elbow there and if we want a better idea of what's going on here in this bicep this muscle why don't we just take a cut so let me just cut right about there we'll get a cross-sectional look of what's going on in our muscle so here's the little cut we just did right about here. Our muscle just kind of hanging out in the middle. 
sort of that same shape that comes down about here. And we still got our tendon, of course, that's anchoring our muscle over to our bone. Don't forget the tendon that's still right here. And the tendon is just a type of connective tissue. And this is somewhat continuous with the connective tissue that covers the outermost layer of our muscle right here. So I'm just drawing that in. This outer layer of muscle we've got here is called the epimyceum, the epimyceum, however you want to call it. And that's sort of continuous with the tendon and it's supposed to help protect our muscle here so it doesn't shear against the bone or all the other things that are in the compartment of our arm if we're talking about the bicep. But as you know, this can apply to muscles in our leg or in our jaw when we're chewing, anything that we control. So in addition to this connective tissue layer, there's another connective tissue layer that's sort of on the inside right here, underneath the epimyceum. And so this connective tissue layer, I'll just draw sort of as a circle or as a sheath that's kind of sitting around here. This guy is called the paramyceum, the perimyceum. And this paramyceum covers subunits of muscle that sit right here. And there's a bunch of them, and they all have their own names. So I'll, I'll take this one right here and just kind of draw it out a little more so we can take a closer look inside. So this little dude right here, this muscle subunit that's covered by this paramecium that I'm shading in right here, this is called a fascicle. It's got two names, actually. So it can be called a fascicle, fascicle, C-I-C-L-E. It's also known as a fasciculus, a fasciculus. So it depends on whether you're talking about fascicles or a single fasciculus, however, whatever term you want to use. And then within the fascicle, within each of the fascicles, there's another connective tissue layer. This is called the endomyceum. The endomyceum. Now this covers individual muscle cells. So finally we've reached the individual muscle cells. I'll draw one of these dudes coming out right here. This is an individual muscle cell that's covered by the endomyceum. And so the muscle cell that I'm writing out over here, it has a special name as well, so we can call it a muscle cell, but we can also call it a myo, myo meaning muscle, fiber. So this is shaped like a fiber because it is longer than it is wide. And again, this endomyceum, just like the paramyceum, contains nerves and blood vessels that can help conduct neuronal signals and blood towards the individual myofiber and the connective tissue that sits around here. Okay, so now that we've gotten to the muscle cell, why don't we just scroll down a little bit and just kind of just focus in on this guy. Now, while we might be tempted to draw the muscle cell just kind of like that fiber that I just drew over there, like this sort of rectangle, remember, in fact, that it's sort of shaped a little differently like a pipe that has a couple of bumps outside. Do you guys remember why do we have bumps on the outside of our muscle cells or the outside of our myofibers? I think I heard one of you said because there are nuclei that sit on the outskirts of our muscle cells. And that is absolutely correct. This is a single nucleus that I'm drawing right here. Here's one nucleus. And this is sort of the storage unit of DNA that can help us replicate or make more of our myofibers or our muscle cells. And they sit on the outskirts of our myofiber towards sort of the edge of our plasma membrane. This plasma membrane has a special name in muscle. It's called the sarcolemma. Sarcolemma. We've got a couple of important prefixes that we sort of mentioned here. Remember I mentioned myo kind of from above? Myo just means muscle. Just keep that in the back of your mind. And then sarco, whenever you see sarco, that refers to just flesh. And we often see this in the context of muscle because the covering of our muscle cell right here, that membrane, we call it the sarcolemma, the cytoplasm right here that's within the muscle cell, we call that the sarcoplasm the sarcoplasm. And as we get further in, we're also going to talk about the sarcomere. And so if we're talking about our myofiber right here, let me just make it look a little more tubular. So the myofiber itself, this muscle cell, has a bunch of smaller units within it too. And these smaller units 
are where we have our main contractions occurring. So I'm going to draw one of these guys out right here. And this is just called the myo, like muscle, fibril. Not fiber, but myofibril. Now we've come to where we're storing our myosin and our actin that's sitting inside here. This is where the actual contraction will occur. So if we look at our muscle cells under a microscope, we'll see that they've got these striations on them, these bands. Because remember, another name for skeletal muscle is striated skeletal muscle. So they have these lines that are here that you'll see under a microscope. So if we blow that up, let me just get some space down here to talk about it. So if I were to draw just kind of a blown up version of it right here, we'd have our striation line right there. I'll draw another one right here and right here. Just put it in this line and this box right here. And we have all these bands that we would see under the microscope, right? So we have the striations that are on the sides and there are these bands that are kind of going across this unit right here that we're looking at. Now what are these striations right here? Well, we talked about these before. Sal mentioned these are the Z lines. So the Z lines are these striations we see under the microscope. And so I've drawn three of them here for you guys. Z lines, and I'll just connect that one back here. And remember the space between two Z lines going from here all the way to here. That's the sarcomere. The sarcomere. And this is our most basic unit of contraction. This is where we're going to have our actin and our myosin fibers interact and have us flex at our most macro level we'll get back to in a second. And there are different parts of the sarcomere, right? There's the part that's designated the A band that's in the middle. There's this other part up here called the I band. The I band. All right, so let's focus in on a single sarcomere right here a single sarcomere. So I'm drawing the outskirts of our sarcomere, of course, so that's going to be our Z line. That's hanging out on either side. I've drawn two of them here. Anchored to our Z line is going to be our actin filaments. Here are the actin filaments that we've heard about before. I'll just label this. This is our actin filament. Remember, sitting inside is going to be our myosin. And our myosin filament, remember, it's got two heads and it's associated right here with the actin. It wants to kind of pull on the actin and just crawl along of it. Crawl along the actin. And I'll draw one here as well. It's myosin heads. Two myosin heads right there. And they're attached top and bottom like that. And they just want to walk across, alright? So I want to make sure that I draw that here too. All right, and you get the picture down here. And so anchoring our myosin filaments in the sarcomere is going to be titan. We'll just draw the titan here. It's not attached to the ends of the myosin, but you can kind of see that it's holding it in place from somewhere deeper in right there. So that's our, our titan. So our titan. And again, this is our myosin, this guy. Myosin filaments with the two heads that come up. And at this point, we can appreciate some of the bands we talked about over here. The part that's both myosin and actin is called the A-band. That's the A-band that we drew on the left side over here. And the part that's only actin, actin that doesn't involve any of the myosin, that's this point right here. And it continues on into the other sarcomere. This is the I-band, the I-band. And the way I think about it, I kind of looks like a one, right? So it's got one of our two major filaments. And then A is the alternative one, the other one that's got myosin and actin in it. So that's the A band and the I band. All right. So now when you recall, so there's this axon fiber that's going to come in and release a message, an action potential that's going to come here and depolarize our sarcolemma and it's going to sort of spread everywhere. It's not just going to go in one direction. And one of the things that we have in our sarcolemma are T-tubules that can allow the depolarization or this action potential to go deep within our muscle cell or our myofiber to cause the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium. 
Calcium then, as you remember, goes on to bind troponin. Troponin that's sitting on our actin will then tell tropomyosin, get the heck out of the way. And then our myosin, our myosin filaments that we drew right here, can go ahead and use ATP to sort of walk along our actin filaments. And so they would sort of walk along this way. And they would, you know, relatively to the actin filament, stand still. They would be crawling this way, but wouldn't really do any of the moving. They'd be anchored down. It's the actin filaments, actually. Was this not audible? Did you guys not hear anything? Hello? Sir, it was not audible. It was not audible. Uh, let's try again. Let's now, why don't we take a step back? Now, why don't we take a step back and take a look at how muscles work on more of attached to it right here, so that's some tendon, so I'll label that right there, and that's just some tendon that's on either side of our muscle, our bicep right here, and the tendon attaches our muscle over to some bone, so there's a little bone right there. Uh, not clear, I mean, it is not clear. Okay, 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 okay. let me play it on the browser, that should be clear. Now why don't we take a step back and take a look at how muscles work on more of a macro level. So why don't we start out by just drawing a little muscle right here. Let's say this is just the bicep and on either side there's a little bit of tendon that's kind of attached to it right here so that's some... This is okay, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Some tendon, so I'll label that right there and that's just some tendon that's on either side of our muscle, our bicep right here. And the tendon attaches our muscle over to some bone. So there's a little bone right there. There's a little bone right there. Label these guys. So that's one bone. And, and then here's another one. So if it's our bicep, it's anchored onto our humerus. And this is our bicep, right? So I'll just draw it in the arm. Here, this guy is sort of like flexing right there. Coming down to the elbow. There. And if we want a better idea of what's going on here in this bicep, this muscle, why don't we just take a cut? So let me just cut right about there. We'll get a cross-sectional look of what's going on in our muscle. So here's the little cut we just did right about here. Our muscle just kind of hanging out in the middle. Sort of that same shape that comes down about here. And we still got our tendon, of course, that's anchoring our muscle over to our bone. Don't forget the tendon that's still right here. And the tendon is just a type of connective tissue. And this is somewhat continuous with the connective tissue that covers the outermost layer of our muscle right here. So I'm just drawing that in. This outer layer of muscle we've got here is called the epimyceum. The epimyceum, however you want to call it. And that's sort of continuous with the tendon and it's supposed to help protect our muscle here so it doesn't shear against the bone or all the other things that are in the compartment of our arm if we're talking about the bicep but as you know this can apply to muscles in our leg or in our jaw when we're chewing anything that we control so in addition to this connective tissue layer there's another connective tissue layer that's sort of on the inside right here underneath the epimyceum and so this connective tissue layer I'll just draw sort of as a circle or as a sheath that's kind of sitting around here. This guy is called the paramyceum. The perimyceum. And this paramyceum covers subunits of muscle that sit right here. And there's a bunch of them. And they all have their own names. So I'll, I'll take this one right here and just kind of draw it out a little more so we can take a closer look inside. So this 
little dude right here. This muscle subunit that's covered by this paramecium that I'm shading in right here, this is called a fascicle. It's got two names actually. So it can be called a fascicle, fascicle, C I C L E. It's also known as a fasciculus, a fasciculus. So it depends on whether you're talking about fascicles or a single fasciculus, however, whatever term you want to use. And then within the fascicle, within each of the fascicles, there's another connective tissue layer. This is called the endomyceum. The endomyceum. Now this covers individual muscle cells. So finally we've reached the individual muscle cells. I'll draw one of these dudes coming out right here. This is an individual muscle cell that's covered by the endomyceum. And so the muscle cell that I'm writing out over here, it has a special name as well, so we can call it a muscle cell, but we can also call it a myo, myo meaning muscle fiber. So this is shaped like a fiber because it is longer than it is wide. And again, this endomyceum, just like the paramyceum, contains nerves and blood vessels that can help conduct neuronal signals and blood towards the individual myofiber and the connective tissue that sits around here. Okay, so now that we've gotten to the muscle cell, why don't we just scroll down a little bit and just kind of just focus in on this guy. Now, while we might be tempted to draw the muscle cell just kind of like that fiber that I just drew over there, like this sort of rectangle, remember, in fact, that it's sort of shaped a little differently like a pipe that has a couple of bumps outside. Do you guys remember why do we have bumps on the outside of our muscle cells or the outside of our myofibers? I think I heard one of you said because there are nuclei that sit on the outskirts of our muscle cells. And that is absolutely correct. This is a single nucleus that I'm drawing right here. Here's one nucleus. And this is sort of the storage unit of DNA that can help us replicate or make more of our myofibers or our muscle cells. And they sit on the outskirts of our myofiber towards sort of the edge of our plasma membrane. This plasma membrane has a special name in muscle. It's called the sarcolemma. Sarcolemma. We've got a couple of important prefixes that we sort of mentioned here. Remember I mentioned myo kind of from above? Myo just means muscle. Just keep that in the back of your mind. And then sarco, whenever you see sarco, that refers to just flesh. And we often see this in the context of muscle because the covering of our muscle cell right here, that membrane, we call it the sarcolemma, the cytoplasm right here that's within the muscle cell, we call that the sarcoplasm the sarcoplasm. And as we get further in, we're also going to talk about the sarcomere. And so if we're talking about our myofiber right here, let me just make it look a little more tubular. So the myofiber itself, this muscle cell, has a bunch of smaller units within it too. And these smaller units are where we have our main contractions occurring. So I'm going to draw one of these guys out right here. And this is just called the myo, like muscle, fibril. Not fiber, but myofibril. Now we've come to where we're storing our myosin and our actin that's sitting inside here. This is where the actual contraction will occur. So if we look at our muscle cells under a microscope, we'll see that they've got these striations on them, these bands. Because remember, another name for skeletal muscle is striated skeletal muscle. So they have these lines that are here that you'll see under a microscope. So if we blow that up, let me just get some space down here to talk about it. So if I were to draw just kind of a blown up version of it right here, we'd have our striation line right there. I'll draw another one right here and right here. Just put it in this line and this box right here. And we have all these bands that we would see under the microscope, right? So we have the striations that are on the sides and there are these bands that are kind of going across this unit right here that we're looking at. Now what are these striations right here? Well we talked about these before. Sal mentioned these are the Z lines. So the Z lines are these striations we see under the microscope. And so I've drawn three of them here for you guys. Z lines and I'll just connect that one back here. And remember the space between two Z lines going from here all the way to here. 
That's the sarcomere. The sarcomere. And this is our most basic unit of contraction. This is where we're going to have our actin and our myosin fibers interact and have us flex at our most macro level we'll get back to in a second. And there are different parts of the sarcomere, right? There's the part that's designated the A band that's in the middle. There's this other part up here called the I band. The I band. All right, so let's focus in on a single sarcomere right here. A single sarcomere. So I'm drawing the outskirts of our sarcomere, of course. So that's going to be our Z line. That's hanging out on either side. I've drawn two of them here. Anchored to our Z line is going to be our actin filaments. Here are the actin filaments that we've heard about before. I'll just label this. This is our actin filament. Remember, sitting inside is going to be our myosin. And our myosin filament, remember, it's got two heads and it's associated right here with the actin. It wants to kind of pull on the actin and just crawl along of it. Crawl along the actin. And I'll draw one here as well. It's myosin heads. Two myosin heads right there. And they're attached top and bottom like that. And they just want to walk across, all right? So I want to make sure that I draw that here too. All right, and you get the picture down here. And so anchoring our myosin filaments in the sarcomere is going to be titan. We'll just draw the titan here. It's not attached to the ends of the myosin, but you can kind of see that it's holding it in place from somewhere deeper in right there. So that's our, our titan. So our titan. And again, this is our myosin, this guy. Myosin filaments with the two heads that come up. And at this point, we can appreciate some of the bands we talked about over here. The part that's both myosin and actin is called the A-band. That's the A-band that we drew on the left side over here. And the part that's only actin, actin that doesn't involve any of the myosin, that's this point right here. And it continues on into the other sarcomere. This is the I-band. The I-band. And the way I think about it, I kind of looks like a one, right? So it's got one of our two major filaments. And then A is the alternative one, the other one that's got myosin and actin in it. So that's the A band and the I band. All right. So now when you recall, so there's this axon fiber that's going to come in and release a message, an action potential that's going to come here and depolarize our sarcolemma and it's going to sort of spread everywhere it's not just going to go in one direction and one of the things that we have in our sarcolemma are T tubules that can allow the depolarization or this action potential to go deep within our muscle cell or our myofiber to cause the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium Calcium then, as you remember, goes on to bind troponin. Troponin that's sitting on our actin will then tell tropomyosin, get the heck out of the way. And then our myosin, our myosin filaments that we drew right here, can go ahead and use ATP to sort of walk along our actin filaments. And so they would sort of walk along this way. And they would, you know, relatively to the actin filament, stand still. They would be crawling this way, but wouldn't really do any of the moving. They'd be anchored down. It's the actin filaments, actually, that move. The actin filaments are going to be moving closer in to the center, and that effectively causes our I-band to get smaller. The I-band is going to get smaller when we have our sarcomere contract. And because the A-band involves however far the myosin spreads, the A-band does not change. Only the I-band changes here as we effectively bring the two Z lines closer to each other and shorten the length of our sarcomere. And that's what's happening on our most micromolecular level right here with the sarcomere contracting. And all of that began with this axon fiber spreading the signal. So I hope you can appreciate just kind of going from the top right here when we're contracting our skeletal muscle and we go through all these smaller layers, what's happening at this molecular level right here? What's allowing us to contract to flex our arm or kick a ball or do something of that nature? And I hope you found all of this to be somewhat useful to you.
so okay so that was about the anatomy of the skeletal muscle i saw a hand going up in between does anyone has any questions from this uh, video then we can discuss that and then go move on so i will assume that the video was clear and now we have a good solid understanding of anatomy of the muscle and we can go for the today's question and succession uh is the ppt visible to everyone the powerpoint is visible right hello yes sir So we will be going forward with today's question and answer session. Okay, so the first question for today is: Dash is the smallest functional unit of a striated muscle tissue. So how we do this is that uh, I will show you one question and then encourage you to put whatever you think is the correct answer out of A, B, C, D into the chat box, and then we will be discussing about the question a bit and then answer it. so the options for the question blank is the smallest functional unit of a striated muscle tissue are a band z band sarcomere or toponym you can put whatever you think is the correct answer in the chat Okay, so which was G said D, then change it to C, sarcomere. So Kamla says it is sarcomere. Anita says it is C, sarcomere. I saw another raised hand. Did anyone have any questions for this or any opinions to answer? Bobby also says it is C, sarcomere. Anyone else? this is what we will we were dealing with in the previous slide so this is a cross section of the entire muscle fiber so this is the entire muscle joint to a tendon if you look closely into the muscle you will see that it is made out of smaller subunit which are also tube like these are individ individual muscle fibers or individual muscle cells these cells if you look even closer are made out of something known as muscle myofibrils these myofibrils are inside the cells and contain the uh, various mitochondria multi, uh, have various multiple nuclei as we know muscle cells are multinucleated and have a small uh, myofibril part of it which is also tubular if we look even closer into the myofibril we will see that it is actually made out of a striated pattern which repeats amongst itself and zooming in we see this is what it looks like this is the striated pattern that we see in muscle cells and it is it makes up something and the smallest unit it make it is made out of is known as the sarcomere so this right here is a sarcomere it consists of uh the boundaries of the sarcomere are made out of two z discs as you can see these look like z like a uh, lot of z's joined together and that is why these are not known as z discs and everything in between the z discs are repeated throughout the entire myofibril so inside the z discs there are different zones and these zones are designated as the myosin containing 
azo as you can see right here the thicker filament is the myo uh, myosin and the thinner green filament is the actin so the middle part where there is only myosin it is known as the azo the broader part which contains both the actin and the myosin are known as the a band and the last part which contains no myosin but only actin is known as the i band so entire sarcomere is made out of this and this is the smallest functional unit of the muscle where actually the contraction takes place and we have energy production so wait a moment i think this is not moving correctly so this is what i was talking about the eight zone so these are uh, sarcomere has z lines that represent its boundaries right here in between we have two types of filament one purplish thicker filament which is actually the myosin and one thinner green filament which represents the actin and both of these make up the entire sarcomere the middle part of it only has myosin and is known as eight zone the broader part of it the majority part of the sarcomere is made out of a overlap between the thicker and the thinner filaments this is known as the a band and finally we have the region where there is no myosin but only actin present this is known as the i band so can anyone tell me what do you think the striations the striped pattern in the muscle cell is made out of like if you look at the muscle cell you can see right something like this as you can see right here a dark band followed by a light band followed by a dark band followed by a light band what do you think these bands are can you even try and answer this so these are essentially the repetitive a and i bands the a band as you can see right here is very dense with a number of filament crossing each other and this actually appears dark under light whereas the i band does not have any myosin in it and is very easily light can easily pass through it and it appears lighter in color and that is why you see light and dark striation patterns in skeletal muscle cells okay finally we come up to a better drawing of the sarcomere so the thick filament is the myosin the thin filament is the actin if you look closely you will be uh, again seeing the patterns the z discs making up the boundaries of the sarcomere the middle of the sarcomere does not have any actin and is known as the eighth zone most of the sarcomere is made out of a overlap between the actin and the myosin and is known as the a band and at the end of the sarcomere there is a portion where there is no overlap between the actin and the myosin and only actin is present and this is known as the i band so this is how the sarcomere looks like any question from this no one has any questions from this you can put it in, into the chat if you have any questions also okay so coming to a question dash is the smallest functional unit of a striated muscle tissue the answer is c sarcomere moving on uh the next question is in the actin myosin complex for muscle function 
actin forms the blank and myosin forms the blank the options are thin filament thin filament thin filament thick filament thick filament thin filament and thick and thin or both thick so a b c d four options you can put whatever you think is the correct answer into the chat Somebody says it is B, thin filament for actin, thick for myosin. Vishwajit also says it is B. Anyone else wants to try? Anita says it is B, thin filament and thick filament. Anyone else? Dibya also says there is B. Okay. So moving on, if we look even more closely into the sarcomere, then we will be looking at the structures of both the myosin and the actin. So the myosin the filament is made out of myosin light and heavy chains. These form a complex and these uh, form two parts. One is the myosin head which is looks like this which is a double headed structure like this with the tail being embedded into the filament this head is crucial for the contraction of the muscle to take place and then we have the actin filament the actin filament is made out of three parts actin which is shown in here as green uh, tropomyosin which is shown in orange uh, uh, another smaller filament on top of the actin and finally troponin which are these orange uh, spheres right here and these are lay on top of the actin and the tropomyosin. Now here the actin uh, filaments are designed in the way that they can actually attach to the myosin heads but this attachment is prevented by the tropomyosin the orange line right here you can see these darker green circles inside which are covered by the orange line these are where the myosin could attach so in resting care conditions the tropomyosin prevents any interaction between the actin filament and the myosin and here we another uh, again have the image of the sarcomere right here okay so and here the thicker as you can see right here the thicker broader filament is the myosin and the thinner green colored filament is the actin so coming back to the question in the actin myosin complex for muscle function actin forms the thin filament and myosin forms the thick filament so the correct option is option b moving on which of the areas highlights a region that has myosin but no actin filaments? The options are A band, A H zone, A band H zone, H zone, and A band and I band. Which has myosin but no actin? Vishwajit says it is C H zone. Okay, anyone else that wants to try and answer this? Kamlesh also says it is 8 zone option C. Anyone else? Medina also says it is C8 zone. Subal also says it is 8 zone. Okay. So again, looking at closely at the image of the sarcomere, uh, we see that the middle portion where there is no actin present is known as the 8 zone. 
the portion with overlap between actin and myosin is known as the A band and the portion with only actin is known as the I band. So yes, so giving us correct, the correct option where there is only myosin and no actin is the eighth one, option C. Moving on, which of the area contains an overlap between actin and myosin? Options are A band, A B band, A zone and A I band. You can put your, in your answer whatever you think is correct. Usually it says it is A, A band which has the overlap of actin and myosin and anyone else. Anyone else wants to try and answer this? Okay. Again, going back to the drawing of a sarcomere. We see that A band is the region which has an overlap of both actin and myosin right here, as you can see. So the correct option is which of the following area has an overlap of actin and myosin, the option is A band. Kromlesh also says A band right? Yes, you are correct. So let me check one thing. Yes. Okay. Going back. The subunit of troponin which has the higher affinity for tropomyosin is troponin I, troponin T, troponin C or none of the above. Which subunit unit of troponin has a higher activity or affinity for tropomyosin? A, B, C, D, we can put in whatever you think is the correct option. Says it is troponin T, which is a higher affinity for tropomyosin. Anyone else wants to try and answer this? Surajit also says it is B, troponin T. Sibani also says it is B, troponin T. Anyone else? So this on the left is what troponin looks like. What we saw as yellow circles on the image previously is actually a protein made out of complex of three subunits. Troponin has three subunits named troponin T, troponin C and troponin I. Troponin T binds to tropomyosin. Troponin C has an affinity for calcium ions and troponin I binds to actin. Now what happens is that normally as I said tropomyosin and uh, if you look at the image on the left I will move this tropomyosin is like a band on top of all the active sites covering uh, the interaction between the actin and the myosin and uh, troponin is also present on various regions along this entire band of tropomyosin. Once we introduce calcium ions into the mix, tropo troponin preferentially binds to calcium instead of actin. What this does is that it moves the entire tropomyosin uh, filament away from the active sites. And these active sites are now exposed to bind to myosin 
and initiate muscle contraction so your muscle contraction necessarily needs calcium ions to be present in the muscle fiber and if it is not present then the uh, entire uh, myosin and actin cannot interact and there will be no interact uh, no muscle contraction so troponin essentially has three uh, three different components troponin t c and i t binds to tropomyosin c binds to calcium and i binds to actin and once calcium is present troponin prevents the interaction between tropomyosin and active site on present on actin and allows for actin myosin uh, interaction so coming back to the question the subunit of troponin that has higher affinity for tropomyosin is troponin t any questions from this does uh, everyone understand if i guess so everyone has understood this so i will be moving on dash leads to actin myosin binding and dash leads to their detachment the options are atp and calcium ions atp and adp calcium ions and atp and calcium ions and adp so what leads to actin myosin binding and what leads to their detachment from each other so a b c d whichever you think is the correct option you can put into the chat Kamlay says it is C, calcium ions and ATP. Anyone else? Surajit also says it is C, calcium ions, ATP. Anyone else that wants to answer? Anyone else that want to answer this? Okay, so we will be looking at how exactly the contraction of muscles takes place. So we have already looked at these uh, the muscle uh, myosin thicker filament which has these heads if you zoom in you will be able to look at that it has a tail piece as well a hinge piece and finally a head piece right here the head piece has sites for binding to actin and the head also has by uh, sites to act to atp thus myosin is also atpase it uses atp in order to produce the movement that is required for muscle contraction and here we have a zoom in uh, image of actin which is essentially actin molecules which are in green forming a large filament on which lie the orange line of tropomyosin and finally the orange circle representing troponin so this is how muscle contraction takes place so in the resting stage myosin is uh, has already hydrolyzed ATP and has ADP and PI attached on top of it and in this particular stage myosin has a lot of potential energy inside it and it is logged into this particular arrangement so uh, it is locked into particular arrangement as you can see it is right here and is trying to bind to uh, active once you have calcium in the mix the tropomyosin moves out of the way and myosin he uh, head can bind to actin once it binds to actin it releases both adp and pi and releases all of its stored potential energy in the power stroke so essentially 
the myosin moves like this to this position it was held in this position for a long time and once it uh, it binds to actin it moves like this this is known as the power stroke once this happened essentially the entire actin and myosin slide on each other and that is why it is known as the sliding filament theory so why essentially actin is moved along the myosin chain towards the middle so essentially the sarcomere shortens because of this once the power stroke is done atp again binds to our myosin ahead and puts it back in its higher potential energy state where it is ready to provide another power stroke and but essentially what has happened is that myosin has moved one step forward essentially this entire thing has happened actin has moved from one place to another due to the power stroke and now the myosin is again prepared to perform another power stroke the moment calcium is available so this is how exactly the uh, sliding filament theory works i will show you another image which is a bit clearer so here we have binding of myosin to actin this requires calcium so here we have the actin filament this is the myosin filament and here the act myosin head binds to our actin and this definitely requires calcium once this occurs the attachment between the actin and myosin occurs myosin releases the inorganic phosphate from atp so atp is made out of adp so atp is adenosine triphosphate it is made out of adenosine diphosphate and uh, inorganic uh, phosphate so once the hydrolyzed inorganic phosphate is released we observe the power stroke the actin moves due to the movement in the myosin you can see the shape change from right here to this position this moves the actin and this essentially is the power stroke once this happens the adp is also released and a new atp molecule comes and joins to the myosin this again causes the myosin to go back to its potentially higher state which is this it goes back from the power stroke state to the normal state and in this position it remains attached to the adp and pi till calcium comes along and allows the binding between the actin and the myosin again to reoccur the entire cycle so this is how the entire power stroke works in so atp is the uh, so calcium is the molecule which allows interaction with actin and myosin and atp is the molecule which detaches actin from myosin is this fine anyone has any questions from this I guess this is clear so coming back to our original question blank leads to actin myosin binding and blank leads to their detachment so the answers are calcium ions are required for actin myosin binding and atp attachment to myosin leads to removal of actin and myosin interaction so option is option c calcium ions and atp any questions from this anyone because this is probably the most important part of the entire muscular system that we we'll, we are learning how exactly the power stroke works okay next we we'll move on uh to the next question uh, it is length tension relationship relates the strength of blank 
to the length of the muscle at which contraction occurs. The options are isobaric contraction, isometric contraction, hypobaric contraction, hypoxic contraction. Uh, so four option A, B, C, D. You can put in whatever you think is the correct in the chat. Length tension relationship between uh, relates the strength of blank to the length of muscle at which the contraction occurs. Surajit says it is B, isometric contraction. Anyone else wants to try and answer this? Else wants to try? Okay. Uh, so here we have another video which I will be playing directly in the browser. Okay, so someone let me know if this is audible or not. So I'm going to drop the length tension relationship. This will be kind of. Is this audible? Yes, sir. Okay. So I'm going to drop the length tension relationship. This will be kind of the. Uh, the key idea we're going to talk about in this video and it's very related to some stuff we've already talked about so we've talked about for example the Frank Starling curve and that was kind of talking about how if you stretch out heart cells and all of the things within heart cells all the proteins then it actually changes the force of contraction and, and actually force of contraction is very much related to this uh, length tension relationship as well so I'm going to put that up here force of contraction and instead of using that terminology, though, we're going to use the term tension. I, I mean, you can essentially think of them the same way, but classically the word tension is what everyone uses, so we're going to use that same word. And then as far as length, uh, specifically the length that we're talking about is the length of a sarcomere. So I'm going to write sarcomere here. And a sarcomere, just keep in mind, is really going from one Z-disc to another Z-disc. So to, to draw this out, to actually kind of write it out maybe, we can start with myosin. So maybe this is our myosin right here and I'll draw some myosin heads here and maybe some myosin heads on this side as well. And of course you know it's gonna be symmetric looking, roughly symmetric. So this is our myosin and actually I'm gonna make some copies of it now just to make sure that I don't have to keep drawing it out for you. But something like that and we'll move it to be just below so that you can actually see when I draw a few of them, how they differ from one another. So I'm going to put them as best I can right below one another. And we'll do a total of, let's say, five. And I think by the time we get to the fifth one, you'll get an idea of kind of what this overall graph will look like. So these are our five myosins. And to start out at the top, I'm going to, I'm going to show a very crowded situation. So this will be kind of what happens when really nothing is spread out. It's very, very crowded. And you recall that you have actin, kind of this box or this half box that I'm drawing is our actin. And then you have two of them, right? And they have their own polarity, we said, and they kind of go like that. And so in this first scenario, this very, very first one that I'm drawing, this is our scenario one, we have a lot of crowding issues. That's kind of the major issue, right? Because you can see that our titan, which is in green, is really not allowing any space, or there is no space really. And so these ends, we, remember these are our Z disks right here. This is Z and this is Z over here. 
our Z disks are right up against our myosin. In fact, there's almost no space in here. This is all crowded on both sides. There's no space for the myosins to actually pull the Z disk any closer. So because there's no space for them to work, they really can't work. And so they really, if you uh, give them ATP and say, you know, go to work, they're going to turn around and say, well, you know, we've, we've got no work to do because the Z disk is already here. So in terms of force of contraction for this scenario one, I would say you're going to get almost no contraction. So when the length is very low, so let's say this is low, actually maybe low is not a good word for length. Let's say this is, I'll use the word short. The sarcomere is short. And here the sarcomere is long. So when it's short, meaning this distance is actually very short, then we would say the amount of tension is going to be actually zero because you really can't get any tension started unless you have a little bit of space between the Z-disc and the myosin. So now in scenario two, let's say this is scenario two, and this is my one circled over here. In scenario two, what happens? Well, here you have a little bit more space, right? So let's draw that. Let's draw a little bit more space. Let's say you've got something like that. And I'm going to draw the other actin on this side, kind of equally long, of course. Oh, I didn't draw that correctly. Because if it's sliding out, you're going to have an extra bit of actin, right? Something like that. And it comes up and over like that. So this is kind of what the actin would look like. And of course, I want to make sure I draw my titan. Titan is kind of helpful because it helps demonstrate that there's now a little bit of space there where there wasn't any bef before. And so now there is some space between the Z-disc and this myosin right here. So there is some space between these myosins and the Z-discs. In fact, I can draw arrows all the way around. And so there is a little bit of work to be done. But I still wouldn't say that it's maximal force because, look, you still have some overlap issues. Remember, these myosins right here, they're not able to work, and neither are these because of this blockage that's happening here, this blockage, because of the fact that, of course, actin has a certain polarity. So they're getting blocked. They can't do their work. And so even though you get some force of contraction, it wouldn't be maximal. So I'll put something like this. This will be our second spot. And this will be number two. Now in number three, things are going to get much better. So you'll see very quickly, now you have a much more spread out situation where now these are actually these actins are really not going to be in the way of each other. You can see they're not bumping into each other. They're not in the way of each other at all. And so all of the myosins can get to work. So the Z-discs are now out here. My overall sarcomere, of course, as I said, was from Z-disc to Z-disc. So my sarcomere is getting longer. And you can also see that because now there's more Titan, right? And, and there isn't actually more Titan. I shouldn't use that phrase. But the Titan is stretched out. So here, more work is going to get done. And now my force, I would say, is maximal. So I've got lots and lots of force, finally. And so it would be something like this. And so based on my curve, I've also kind of also demonstrated another point, which is that the first issue, getting us from kind of point one to point two, really helped a lot. Really, I mean, that was the big, big deal, because you needed some space here. Again, this space really was necessary, right, to, to do work at all. And now that we've gotten rid of the overlap issue, now that we've gotten these last few myosins working, we have even more gain. But the gain was really the biggest advantage was in that first step. Now, as we go on, let's go to step four. So this is step four now. As we go here, you're going to basically see that this is going to continue to work really well because you have your actin like that. And all of your myosins are still involved in making sure that they can squeeze. So all of the myosins are working. And our Titan is just a little bit more stretched out than it was before. And our force of contraction is going to be maximal. You're going to have, and so here I'm drawing the Z-discs again. They're very spread out. Our, our sarcomere is getting longer and longer. And our force of contraction is the same. Now let's just take a pause there and say, why is it the same? Why did it not go up? Well, it's because here in stage three, you had 20 myosin heads working, 20 out of 20. Uh, up here, you had something like 16 out of 20 working. Here, you, we said maybe zero out of 20, right? And here, you again have 20 out of 20. So you still have uh, an advantage in terms of all of the myosins working, but there's no difference between 0.3 and 0.4 because, again, all the myosins are working. You can't, you can't do better than 100%, right? 
So now in stage five, we kind of take this a little too far, right? So let me actually just make a little bit of space here. But we take this a little bit too far in the sense that our actin, you know, is going to kind of slip out all the way over here. And it's going to be out all the way over here. So we've got a huge, huge gap now. And of course, our titan is completely stretched out. This is about as stretched out as our titan is going to get, this green titan protein. And now the question is, of course, would you get any force? And you know the answer is probably no, because the myosins aren't even touching the actins anymore. So really, again, you have 0 out of 20 myosins at work. And of course, that means that then the amount of force would be 0. So we go back down to 0. So this is part 5. So you can see now, as we've gotten longer and longer, things were good for a while, but then they kind of drifted all the way back down. And this curve that I'm showing you, this tension length curve, is now based on exactly what you see on the right. It's based completely on the idea that as you stretch things out, the amount of force changes uh, depending on the length of the sarcomere. Anyone has any questions from uh, this particular video? I guess not. Okay. So uh, just quickly going back through it again. Essentially, the length tension relationship of muscle gives us the optimal. Uh, the maximum tension at an isometric length when the length is not increasing then what is the tension that the muscle can exert this can be visualized via the overlap between the actin and myosin which, uh, which we had already seen in the video but we will be going through it again so if there is a lot of overlap that is the sarcomere length is very short then there is no way the myosin to, for the myosin to pull the actin closer. So here we have the least amount of force when the length of the sarcomere is too short. When it is at the optimum overlap and the optimum length, the myosin can pull the hardest and we have the highest force or the highest tension. And finally, when there is a, the sarcomere length increases a lot, then there is no overlap between the myosin and the actin and the myosin cross bridges cannot attach to the actin and thus we again have zero force. Thus this is what the entire curve looks like and the optimal force production is when the muscle is relaxed, when there is uh, optimum overlap between the actin and the myosin. And this, all of this essentially gives you the tension at isometric length when there is no change in length of the muscle. Thus, the length tension relationship relates the strength of an isometric contraction to the length of the muscle at which the contraction occurs. Any questions from this? Anyone wants to ask anything from this? Uh, sir? Yes? Sir, what are other uh, options? Uh, I mean, uh, can you no. explain it? Okay, so isobaric means at equal pressure, baric means pressure, hypobaric means at low pressure and hypoxic means at low oxygen. All of these are conditions that can be applied uh, to different cells, but this essentially is not important for our context. So uh, muscle contraction does not take place at isobaric, con uh, isobaric conditions. Isobaric is, you probably would have heard it from thermodynamics, isobaric is the when the pressure remains constant for a particular reaction. But uh, these are just uh, words which are similar, but not really relevant to the context. 
ओके सर मूविंग ऑन सो द मसल ऑपरेट्स एट द ग्रेटेस्ट एक्टिव टेंशन एट द मसल्स ऑप्टिमम लेंथ द ऑप्टिमल लेंथ इज आल्सो कॉल्ड द ऑप्शंस आर शॉर्टेस्ट लेंथ maximum length resting length or running length so a b c d whichever you think is the correct answer you can put it into the chat you can put whatever you think is the correct answer shortest length maximum length resting length and running length into the chat okay so we have just learned that the optimal force generation is at the at the optimum uh, overlap between the myosin and the actin this occurs as i said at the resting position when there is the resting position is this position in which there is optimal overlap between myosin and actin and uh, this is the region where the muscle can produce the maximum amount of contraction so the option uh, the answer is c resting length okay moving on intrafusal fiber is blank that is also a blank the options are intrafusal fiber is a neuronal fiber and a chemosensor it is a neuronal fiber and a mechanosensor it is a muscle type and chemosensor and it is a muscle type and mechanosensor you can put whatever you think is the correct answer into the chat a b c d four options are present intrafusal fibers what are these vishwajit says it is d uh, muscle type and mechanosensor anyone else wants to try and answer this Surajit also says it is D muscle type and mechanosensor. Anyone else? Okay. so yeah this is a diagram of a muscle but a bit uh, bit in depth but what i want to tell you about the entire thing is that when a muscle stretch how does the muscle understand what exactly is the optimum length it has to return back to so say you have been lifting weights and you lift a large amount of weight and that causes your muscle to stretch when you put it down it has to come back to its relaxed position where it is uh, where it can go back to resting where there is no requirement of atp how does the muscle know what exactly that length is or say you uh, if you had your hand like this and a external force pressed upon your hand so essentially pushing down onto your onto your muscle and uh, essentially causing a contraction right here so you can see right here a contraction but if you take off your hand then your muscle goes back to into same place or if you have seen that if your relatives ever have pinched your uh, cheeks and pulled them you would feel pain the cheeks go further than they should but once they let go of your cheek they go back to their same position so you understand that there is something in the muscles that let them know what the relaxed optimal positioning is and allows them to go back to that position 
this particular sensor is actually a muscle type known as intrafusal muscles here we have a image of intrafusal muscles so these are present deep inside the muscle cells um, essentially muscle fibers and are not attached to the long tube like muscle fibers themselves so these are separate from them and are at the and essentially can stretch uh, and contract along with the entire muscle fibers and these are connected by nerves to the brain and the spinal cord so whenever they are contracted they send a signal to the spinal cord that they are being the muscle fiber is being contracted and then there is a return signal that allows the muscle to relax back to its optimal length so essentially the intrafusal muscle is a muscle type which is multinucleated and is also a mechanosensor it senses the mechanical activity or mechanical uh, stimulus that the external environment puts into it so intrafusal muscles are present inside the muscle fibers and are mechanosensors any question from this okay so intrafusal fiber is a muscle type and a mechanosensor okay so any questions from this guys thoda dheere no sir okay uh so moving on so this is the last question for the day myotubes are options are a mononucleated b multinucleated c non striated and d non contractile so you can put what you think is the correct option into the chat so myotubes are mononucleated multinucleated non striated or non contractile vishwadi says it is b multinucleated anyone else so here we had uh, this was already discussed in the lectures that is uh, there which is the development of the skeletal muscle fibers so we'll be quickly going through this so at a very very early stage say around 4 weeks of after the conception of an embryo the there are many cells which move around the entire embryo have the ability to move and i have not taken their final places and uh, can have different shapes these cells are known as mesenchymal cells some mesenchymal cells are destined to then become uh, our muscles so they start to take up various shapes and differentiate into muscle cells this happens in a step by step fashion first the mesenchymal cells turn into something known as myoblast these myoblasts are determined to become myo uh, the muscle linear cells before this they could have formed anything myoblasts then come together to form a tube like structure and line up essentially one after the other after some time around week 5 these myoblasts have become fused to each other and they share a same cytoplasm and essentially form a large tube containing multiple nuclei this is known as a myotube this myotube after 9 weeks continues to enlarge and forms a three dimensional tube like structure which then 
begins uh, like forms even larger structures by combining amongst other myofilaments so you have mesenchymal cells myoblast myotube joining of myotubes to form my myofilament lot of myofilaments come together to form a muscle fiber this muscle fiber then develops to the uh, and then this muscle fibers then come together with other muscle fibers to form a large thick structure which we know as the muscle so essentially muscles as we had seen in the first uh, question and the first video that the muscles are essentially made out of tube like uh, cells which are known as myotubes which are essentially multi nucleated cells which are fused together and these come together to form myofilaments which come together to form myo muscle fiber which then come together to form the final muscle so answering our question myotubes are essentially multi nucleated cells which are fused together is that clear in questions from this no sir okay so that is all i had for you today i will quickly take your attendance till then anyone has uh, sir yes uh, sir uh, i am currently preparing for uh, csr net uh, so will this course will be beneficial for uh, csr uh for csr i uh, think you do have physiology and anatomy as part of the syllabus right yes sir yes so this will be a good basis to start learning in depth about uh, whatever the syllabus is but you will have to necessarily go through a more in detailed book such as i think arthur gaiten is there arthur gaiten on medical physiology that will help you a lot to understand in detail concepts but this course will be a good start point is what i, I will say i would also encourage you to go through mm. whatever question previous year's question papers to understand what exactly are the type of questions that are asked so that you can have a better idea mm. okay Uh, so with that, I will. Uh, if anyone does not have any questions, uh, then I would say thank you, everyone, for joining, and I will meet you next week for the next session. Thank you.